Well, I'm glad you all could be here with us today. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. I'm just kidding. If you're joining us on Facebook, yeah, that joke wouldn't have gone over if you'd have been here in person. But anyway, if you're watching us on Facebook or maybe you're catching us um, another time uh, further on down in the week, we're glad you're here. And um, we, um, we meet uh, in person for worship at 1030 every Sunday. And then we have our, our main message at 11 o'clock. We invite you to be with us. Next Sunday, we're going to eat breakfast um, starting at 10 o'clock. So if, you'll, if you want to join us for that, um, just be at 7300 Hanover Green Drive in uh, Old Town Mechanicsville, and the zip code is 23111, and uh, that's where we'll be. We'll be having bacon and eggs and pancakes and who knows what else we might uh, scrounge up um, to have next week. So let's begin with a prayer like we always do. Father in heaven, you love us um, uh, in, in ways that we don't comprehend, and um, we we struggle to believe that you love us because we think we know ourselves. And the truth is, we don't know ourselves. If we truly knew ourselves, we would be able to fully comprehend how you love us because your love for us is a love that encompasses all of us, the real us, not the dressed up and polished for church or uh, being around other Christians us. You love the real us. You love the us that thinks things we shouldn't think, uh, drinks things we shouldn't drink, and um, says things that are sometimes hurtful to others. Lord, you love the real us. And so as you meet the real us today, uh, we pray that the masked us, the, the us that tries to um, smooth over and cover up would be crucified and what would be resurrected is the new person that you have created us to be. So, Father, we, we give ourselves to you in Jesus' care and in his name. Amen. So, what is the majestic glory? Um, if you go looking for that phrase, it's, it's hard to find in your Bible. Majestic glory. That's the title of the message today. Majestic glory. And um, it's a reference that comes from the uh, second epistle of Peter uh, to the church. And in verse uh, 16, I'll just read through the whole thing. And uh, I'll tell you what, let's do this first. Um, how many of you have an image in your mind of God? Do you have, a, do you, do you have an image in your mind of God? Um, Hollywood is has um, done much to shape or maybe put an image of God in our minds. Um, you think about um, George Burns. Is that, is that what you think of when you think of God? You know, the, the old man, the grumpy old man with a cigar. Um, what about Morgan Freeman? Is that what you think of? Handsome man in a white suit. Um, what about... The Shaq movie, is that what you think of when you think of God? Well, I'd, I'd say the, the Shaq movie is, is better, but is there an image in our mind that could ever be completely accurate? Well, I don't think on this side of eternity we could say that. And I don't think the New Testament is concerned with you having a perfect image in your mind of God. And let me explain. Over and over in the Bible, we are confronted with, in the New Testament especially, we're confronted with this person named Jesus. And the primary focus of the New Testament, believe it or not, is not this concept or news or invitation for you to have a relationship with Jesus. It's there. That's there. That's part of it. But the primary concern of the New Testament 
is to tell you about this person, Jesus, who has a relationship with God the Father. That's point number one, is the New Testament points us to Jesus in such a way that we see him in his relationship with his Father, and then secondarily to that is about our having a relationship with Jesus. Not so much that you are now responsible with trying to track Jesus down and woo him into this relationship, but rather that Jesus, in your brokenness, in your lostness, has tracked you down. Have you ever lost anything in the bushes? Like in the bushes, bushes. I don't mean like in the shrubs in front of your house, right? There's a, there's a 12 by 20 area, and you know it's in there, and all you have to do is methodically search. Have you ever lost anything when you were on like a two or three mile hike? It's gone. For the most part, it is gone. Years ago at, um, at uh, summer camp in North Carolina at the Rock, we call it the, um, it, it's one of the, you know, if, if you've been in camp ministry, especially camp ministry, you end up with these stories, right? That if we all get together the next year, everybody, somebody's going to tell that story. Well, this story, we call it the Great Tabasco Fiasco. Uh, camp food is camp food. If you've ever been to summer camp, it is what it is, right? And um, one of the things that I had always done at camp to try to prevent anything in camp food from getting me sick is that I, I would always cover it in a good dose of Tabasco sauce or Texas Pete because I figured whatever, whatever's there, this will kill it, right? Well, I had this sling pack, if you know what a sling, it's like a backpack, but it has one strap that kind of goes across your front, and it had this really convenient pocket right here, and it was just perfect for my bottle of Tabasco sauce, so every time I went in the dining hall, I always had my, always had my Tabasco sauce with me, because in my sling pack, I had my little first aid kit, my Bible, you know, the, the things that I had, pocket knife or, or a Swiss Army knife was in there and some other things that I knew I would need on a regular basis, my water bottle. But that, that Tabasco sauce and my, my walkie-talkie were right here, easily convenient to me. Well, we were, I forget what we were doing. We were doing something, and, and uh, Gunny, um, the, the, the guy that, that sort of ran the camp, right, he sent me on an errand because uh, I was chaplain, so I'm just, during the day, I'm walking around to all the different activities with different dorms and, you know, just making small talk and getting to know the campers. And It was August, super hot, super humid, and he sends me on a four-wheeler to go get something that he needed. And so I've got to go down this trail in the woods on this four-wheeler, and I've got to go about a mile through these wooded trails, up hills and down hills, and then I've got to cross this little meadow, and it's just grass and all. Well, the, the sling pack spun around, and, and the, the pack itself was kind of in my lap, and the strap was now behind me, which meant that the, the Tabasco sauce bottle was now upside down. And don't ask me how, but the lid came off. So halfway back, I'm thinking... You know, why is my, my back is on fire? You know, I'm sweating. My pores are wide open. And uh, this, this bottle of Tabasco sauce, every time I hit a bump, you, you know how Tabasco sauce works. You got to shake it a little bit to get the sauce to come out. Shake, shake. Every time I hit a bump, shake, shake, a little bit more. And I've got tobacco sauce running down my back and further, right? And all of a sudden, I'm on fire. It's like, what is going on? And so I finally realized what's happened. I was so late getting back that the dorm was gone. They didn't need the thing anymore because it was all over. So I had to go take a shower. I had to get this tobacco, tabasco sauce off my back. So I didn't want to throw away my Tabasco sauce, right? It was the only Tabasco sauce I had for the whole week. How do you find that little tiny cap? It's gone. You've seen that little lid. 
drop that in a meadow or on a woods path somewhere. That, that is gone forever. So Gunny gets on his radio and he says, hey, all dorms, Pastor Bill lost the lid to his Tabasco sauce. If you see it, would you pick it up? One of the dorms found it. They found that lid. I put it back, put it back on tighter, but I put it back on. And I had my Tabasco sauce for the rest of the week. <laughs> Jesus has not only found us in our mythos, he found us hiding in the bushes with Adam. In the fall, Adam and Eve, mankind, go from walking in the cool of the garden with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in hand-in-hand, -hand, perfect fellowship, and you turn the page, they've believed a lie, and now they're hiding in the bushes. How do you find them? The New Testament is not about you finding Jesus. The New Testament is the news that Jesus has found you. You cannot be lost from him. You cannot hide from him. When Jesus calls people lost, it doesn't mean he has no clue where they are. When Jesus calls people lost, he's telling you whose they are. You know the difference between a lost dog and a stray dog, right? A stray dog doesn't have a home. Just a stray dog. You see a stray dog somewhere and you say, Who's, whose dog is that? Well, I don't think it's anybody's dog. It's just a stray dog. God doesn't have any strays. When he calls people lost, he's telling you that they belong to him. In fact, he even goes so far as to say, I have sheep who are not of this fold and I must go and get them. Jesus does not say, I have sheep who are not of this fold and I sure hope they find me someday. What kind of shepherd is that? If a shepherd knows there's a lost sheep, does the shepherd sit at home and say, I hope they can find their way home? Nothing for us to do. What does the parable say? In the parables of lost things, the shepherd goes after the sheep. What, what part did the sheep play in that story? And remember, it's a made-up story. Jesus made that story up to teach an eternal lesson. And so he can make anybody say or do whatever he wants in his made-up stories. So in his made-up story, if the gospel was about you finding the shepherd, what would the sheep have done? The sheep would have found his way home. What about the coin? What would the coin have done? Well, I guess it would have rolled out from under the couch cushions. When my mother and father were dating, that's how they got money to go to the movies. My grandpa would fall asleep in his recliner and change would fall out of his pockets and then they'd go dump the chair out. And I guess back then you could uh, two people could go see a movie for a quarter. You could both get in, both get... Um, uh, they would share a soda and, a, and share a candy bar, I think, for 25 cents, right? So in the parables of the lost sheep, the sheep doesn't find its way home. The only part the sheep plays is what? It got lost. Woohoo. I mean, if you want to take credit for salvation, if you want to have some credit in the gospel, good. Good for you. You can claim the honor of having gotten lost. That's your big part to play in salvation, is that you got lost. You know, it's fascinating to me that um, and we were talking about this in our um, in our Hebrew study with Robin Smith this week, is that, um, and if you don't know who Robin Smith is, you need to look her up and sign up for one of her studies. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. Highly recommend it. And Davina and I are learning a lot in that class. But anyway, um, you ever, you ever heard somebody tell, we'll just make up a story, but something similar like, um, you know, you're at church and you're talking to some folks, uh, some Christians, and they say, uh, well, my neighbor broke his foot. And so I've been cutting his grass all summer because he broke his foot, right? And maybe your neighbor says, thank you. 
Man, I really appreciate that. And a lot of times in the church, what we do is we say, well, you know, don't steal my glory. You know, don't steal my reward. You know, that's, don't, don't give me credit for that. That's God. You know, that's just God in my life. Don't give me credit for that. But then when we talk about salvation, we want to take half the credit. We won't take full credit for cutting somebody's grass, but we're going to try to take some of the credit for salvation. Yeah, but I believe I said a prayer. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say you have to do X to make Jesus work a finished work. Who gets to decide if Jesus' work is finished? Well, I'd, I'd say probably the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit get to make that decision. And I sort of feel like if it was finished, Jesus would have at least told us it was finished somewhere. You know, it, maybe, maybe from some place significant. When you're going to make an announcement, usually you don't just like go in a closet somewhere and say it. You want to say it so it's everybody hears and it's, it's a significant moment, right? Like a ribbon cutting or some, you know, big announcement. President walks out in the Rose Garden. Ooh, it's the Rose Garden. Everybody pay attention. So if Jesus' work was finished, you'd think he would have at least told us it was finished and he would have done it from some place significant. Like maybe from the cross when he said, it is finished. What part of it is finished? It's only three words. It is finished. And we get that confused. So now let's read First Peter. Uh, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. There are a lot of mythologies <clears throat> in ancient Israel. There was a lot of mythologies in Judea about what the coming of Jesus would be like, what the Messiah would be like when he came. It's one of the reasons why they couldn't accept him when he did come. Because he did, the story didn't match. You can't show up and announce yourself to shepherds. That's like the lowest occupation in Israel. He's just a shepherd. Remember what they said about David? David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of the living God? And they're like, look, shepherd boy, you don't understand. This is man business. You know, we're in the army. Because he's just a shepherd boy. What does he know? He doesn't have to know anything. It's not about knowing. It's about relationship. It's about trust. They saw his majesty. They saw what he did. They heard what he said firsthand. Peter goes on, he says, For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Is God pleased with you? He's pleased with Jesus, we know that. But is God pleased with you? Does that frighten you? You scare me to death. In fact, I used not to care whether I lived or died. I did all kinds of dangerous things when I was a young man because I didn't think God was going to have me. So it doesn't matter what I do, right? If you believe that your fate in eternity, whether God will love you in eternity, is based on how well you can measure up to an impossible standard, what hope is there for a for a, a teenage boy? There's no hope for you. I mean, when I was baptized, I, um, I thought I was clean the second after I was baptized, and I thought that if I had drowned, maybe if I could drown on the way coming out of the water, then, then God would be obligated to take me. I would be clean for a moment. But it had to happen quick. 
because my mind was always racing. My mind was always going. I was always thinking of something to get into, some kind of mischief that didn't, didn't take me long to get in trouble or to find trouble or create trouble and draw other people into it. I got a good idea. Let's, you know, and a lot of times your friend's like, I don't know, man, what if we get caught? That was, that was a common response to things that we came up with when I was a kid. What if we get caught? First thing that come out of somebody's mouth. So if you don't believe God's ever going to take you, what does it matter? Then you might say, well, if you believe that God will accept you no matter what you do, what does it matter? Well, then I'd say, well, we don't understand the gospel yet. Because I can tell you, the more you come to believe in God's unconditional love, the more you want to be in a place to receive that love to share in that life, participate in that life. He received honor and glory from the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We're going to pause here and go to 1 John 4, 17. First John 4, 17. But what have we to fear? Fear has to do with judgment. For as he is, speaking of Jesus, for as he is, so are we in this world. Is Jesus beloved of the Father? Somebody. Is he? Is Jesus beloved of the Father? Well then, from what we just read in 1 John 4, 17, let me ask you again. Are you beloved of the Father? You are beloved of the Father. He doesn't just tolerate you. You know, like he wants to eliminate you from the cosmos. He wants to zap you with a lightning bolt. And Jesus, you know, is standing between you and this angry God. No, you're beloved of the Father. You are beloved of the Father. Peter says, We ourselves, verse 18, heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. This is the, you know, John 17. Go read it. I mean, Matthew 17. Matthew 17. The transfiguration. Jesus takes the big three, I call them, Peter, James, and John. He takes them up onto the mountain and they see Moses and Elijah and they say, Hey, let's build an altar. Let's build three, in fact. We'll build one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And this voice says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Don't listen to the law and the prophets anymore. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. The two ways God had traditionally spoken to Israel, to mankind through Israel. And God the Father is putting Jesus, elevating Jesus above those systems and says, no, not Moses and Elijah. This is not a prophet. This is not a law. This is not just some person. This is my beloved son. So if you're going to listen to anybody, listen to him. We have the prophetic message more fully, more fully confirmed. All the prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus. They're confirmed in Jesus. You can go back, and I forget how many there are, a lot, more than you can count almost, prophecies about Jesus that were fulfilled by Jesus. Yep. Check that box. Heal the... Yep. Give sight to... Yep. Born... Yep. Cruise, yep. Three days. Yep. Resurrect... Yep. Check all the boxes. Every prophecy. There are no prophecies in your Bible anywhere about the coming of the Messiah that were not fulfilled by Jesus. Not one. So Peter says, we've, we've got the prophetic message more fully confirmed. And you will do well to be attentive to this as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. 
First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. People can say what they want about the, the Bible. Well, it was just written by men. Yeah, okay. But inspired by the Holy Spirit. Like, who wrote Hebrews? Well, some people think it was the Apostle Paul. He didn't sign his name to it, though. Maybe because he wrote it to the Hebrews. He wrote it to Jews, and he was considered a, a traitor. He turned his back on his Jewish beliefs and became a Christian. Maybe that's why he didn't put his name. Some people think maybe... He had Priscilla write it for him. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Does that mean that the book doesn't belong in your New Testament? Of course not. Because we know ultimately who wrote it. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit in concert with Jesus and his Father. We all have an image of God in our heads. All of us do. You can't help it. All we can ever hope for in this life is that that image in our heads becomes more and more congruent with the true nature of God. Only so much as it serves the purpose of our experiencing the true nature of God. Ultimately, that's why you're here. Ultimately, that's why you were given a place in Jesus' world was to know the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as you are known by them so that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit could share love and life with you in a mutual, other-centered way. It is impossible to develop an image of God apart from his own self-revelation in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the image, right? Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3 talks about Jesus being the image of God. You want to know what God the Father looks like? Because we've had this idea in the Christian West that God the Father is mean and angry. You don't want to meet that guy. Now, Jesus, he's the cool one. He's the guy that turns water into wine at the party. He's the guy that gives sight to the blind, heals the sick, does all the fun stuff, right? You want to hang out with Jesus. You want to hang out with his dad. Dad gets kind of mad sometimes, right? You don't want to hang out with his dad. No, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, he's as cool as I am. In fact, I can do nothing apart from the will of of God the Father. Oh, so when Jesus is being cool and turning the water into wine, when Jesus is being awesome and raising the high priest's daughter from the dead, or Lazarus calling him out of the tomb after three days when his body stunk, when Jesus is doing all that stuff, oh, that must have been the will of the Father. Then how could the Father be different than Jesus? God the Father is not different than Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are one in mutual other-centered relationship. They coexist together. So, where does that leave us with this majestic glory? Well, the majestic glory is not just a word spoken over you. The majestic glory is not just this statement from heaven about Jesus being the beloved of the Father. The New Testament tells us that it's a statement about you as well because Jesus is the vicarious human being. He's the representative human being. And you're not lost. You don't disappear into Jesus so that you vanish from the cosmos and God doesn't really see you. He just sees Jesus. 
No, God sees you. He sees you. He loves you. He adores you. You're his beloved. But he sees you as the right, relational, healed, whole, forgiven person that Jesus has made you. That's how he sees you. That's why this, this passage, it sounds scary. You know, depart from me, I never knew you. Who's, who's he talking about there? Is he talking about you? Or is he talking about this fake you that you put up? You present this false version of yourself. I don't know. God doesn't know that you. That fake you. God doesn't know that person. God knows the real person. The scared person. The person with wounds from childhood. Abuses. Fears. Phobias. Shortcomings. All of those things. That's the person God knows. You were created to know and be known by the Father, Son, and Spirit and by other people. The evil ones just turn that into your greatest fear. Your greatest desire, and I can say this on the authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ, your greatest desire is to know God as God knows you and then to know your neighbor. But that's our greatest fear because what we think is if you really knew me, you wouldn't like well, I'm here to tell you, God knows you all the way down to the core. And he calls you his beloved. So, obey him. Walk in obedience as God says, let me love you on my own terms. So, the love of God has obviously never been demonstrated more thoroughly then was it on the cross? Jesus didn't go to the cross out of some sense of obligation toward the justice of God. Like, I got to do it. You know, it's part of the formula. You know, if you don't break in the camshaft, when you build a new motor, it could ruin it. No. Jesus goes to the cross because he loves us. Not to satisfy some ledger in heaven. He goes to the cross so that we can go to the cross and be put to death and then consequently be resurrected a new creation. It's love that draws Jesus to the cross. So we'll pass the element of communion. Thank you. i remind you again, um, next week we're having breakfast uh, beginning at 10 a.m. The following week we have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Thomas Meredith Kali, and um, he'll be passing through town on his way to Saudi Arabia um, for an archaeology project, and he's going to tell us some about that, some about uh, his mission work to Muslim areas of the world, preaching the gospel, very exciting stuff. And uh, March 19th, uh, Australian singer-songwriter Vanessa Kirsting will be here with us. And um, what else is happening? Oh, Easter Sunday, we're going to officially relaunch the church. And at some point, I'll have um, Lloyd and Mary Elwell take a little time and tell us about a ministry project that they're getting going um, where they are in... Uh, uh, the, the south side of the of the region here. All right, we all have our bread and wine. Close, he says. Well, the center ring is grape juice, if you prefer it. The 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 children's Sunday school class has come back in to join us for communion, and they're a little concerned about the. The word wine, which I don't know. I mean, when my kids were small, they didn't have any problem whining. But uh, different kind of wine, right?
<laughs> All right. This bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us, buried for us, and resurrected for us into a new creation. This wine represents the cleansing, healing blood of our Savior Jesus. All right, very well. Hey, if you want to, um, if you want to help support what we're doing here, um, you, there are envelopes in the back. You can make a donation that way. You can visit our website, gchanover.org. You can text a gift to 804-409-0445. Um, we do appreciate it. We do. And um, uh, you don't want to miss uh, next, next Sunday. We're going to have a lot of good food for breakfast. So be here um, at 10 o'clock. All right. Love you all. God bless you. See you next Sunday.